Welcome to the RPM website, pages concerning the Battle of the Egedy Islands project. I am Jim Gould. I am chairman of RPM's executive committee. I am also a lawyer at Covington and Burling Law Firm based in Washington, D.C. That is why on some of these slides you will see uh, references to Covington. That is because I originally assembled this presentation uh, for my colleagues at my law firm. I also uh, must acknowledge that uh, some of the videos you will see, many of them, uh, are courtesy of National Geographic TV from a segment of their Drain the Oceans TV show which was filmed uh, last year concerning the project. Uh, also many of the slides I have uh, lifted from or adapted from a presentation by one of our lead archaeologists, Bill Murray. So I want to make that clear from the beginning. Um, let us now turn to the project. I also, by the way, want to emphasize that this is a project that from the inception was inspired by and co-directed by the revered Italian archaeologist Dr. Sebastiano Tuza, who for many years throughout this project was the head of the superintendency of the Sea of Sicily, the agency in charge of underwater archaeology for Sicily. Dr. Tuza was a dear friend and source of intellectual leadership and inspiration for all of us. Tragically, he passed away just a couple of months ago in an airplane crash. We miss him very, very much. Let's begin the presentation at the Forum in ancient Rome in approximately 241 BC. What you see in the foreground is a raised platform for public speaking. That's the dictionary definition of a rostrum, which means a place of rostra. Rostra were the rams on ancient warships. You see here that the front of the rostrum is decorated with these brown objects. They were rams taken from enemy warships and were among the most highly prized Roman trophies of war in a civilization where trophies of war were particularly highly prized. Here's a bit of a better view. We'll see more of these shortly three finned objects made of bronze that were taken from the bows of warships and taken to Rome and put on display to uh, uh, personify Rome's uh, military greatness. So what were these rams? Here's a clip from the National Geographic show. Rams are the super weapons of ancient naval warfare. You can see here that the rostra is just at the waterline, at the bow of the ship, positioned to puncture the enemy warship uh, during a thousand years or more in which there were no cannons, missiles, or other uh, devices. So naval warfare was a matter uh, guided by strategy uh, based on the use of these ramps. For almost a thousand years or more, rams were the pivotal uh, naval weapon, and as most of us know, naval battles played an absolutely key role at any number of pivotal moments in ancient history. Here from the National Geographic show is a clip uh, reconstructing the Battle of the Egedy Islands which gives you a sense of what the, uh, these battles must have been like. We see one fleet arranged in formation and the opposing fleet headed directly toward them for the battle of whose positioning and force was greater when they collided head on. Now let's go to 241 BC. The last year of the first Punic War. Most people, when they think of the Punic Wars, think of Hannibal and the Alps. That was the second 
Punic War some 20 years later with Hannibal. The first Punic War was under the leadership in Carthage of Hasdrubal, Hannibal's father. But here you get a sense from this of how extensive the Carthaginian Empire was, their territory in blue, and how uh, maritime oriented it was, whereas Rome, Republican Rome, had just basically gotten control of the Apennine Peninsula. But a collision was inevitable, and it, the war began in 246 BC, and much of it focused in and around Sicily, where their two uh, uh, imperial ambitions collided. Uh, Carthage was an incredible empire in its day. This is another uh, National Geographic reconstruction, as if it were a helicopter shot, of Carthage and its incredible naval base. And that building actually existed until uh, approximately a hundred years later when in the Third Punic War, Rome finally completely crushed and eradicated Carthage, just took it down to the ground, enslaved or killed virtually all of the population. Um, but from that naval base, for up until 241 BC, the Carthaginian navy uh, went out and took had maritime control over the Mediterranean while Rome was distinctly in second place. And over the 23 years of the First Punic War, a series of naval battles took place all around Sicily, one in North Africa, you see there. And the two that we will focus on are to the left west side of Sicily, Drapana in 249 BC, when some 60 or more Roman ships were driven ashore and captured by the Carthaginians. Those ships surfaced later under Carthaginian reuse at the Battle of the Egeti Islands, some 10 to 12 miles offshore of western Sicily. There you see it with the Red Star. For eight years, ending in 241 BC, the Roman and Carthaginian land armies were locked in a stalemate around encircling this mountain, which is just above ancient Drapana, modern-day Tropani. In the foreground, you see the ferry boats that take uh, visitors out to the Egeti Islands. Uh, but the arch land archaeology has shown that for eight years, which is longer than the uh, both the First or Second World War, the Romans and Carthaginians were entrenched in this area. For some reason, by early 241 BC, the Carthaginians had encountered a, a crisis of supply. They needed to get supplies from home, Carthage, and cash to pay their mercenaries, and Rome had learned about that. Rome embarked on a crash build program to build a larger new fleet and uh, successfully formulated the strategy we will see to intercept the Carthaginian relief fleet. Here you see how the route from Carthage to Drapana and there and thence to the land army involved having to get through the Egeti Islands. Here is a shot of RPM's research vessel Hercules working at the site, the Battle of Egeti Islands. Um, just to give you a quick glimpse, here you see that it's in operation, the ROV is down. Um, we're working exploring the site as you will see shortly further. Here was the 2018 team. Uh, on the right, I particularly want to single out Peter Campbell, furthest to the right, and then immediately next to him, Bill Murray. They are the uh, lead archaeologists on the uh, uh, team. In the middle, you'll also see uh, right next to me, to my 
left George Robb, my uh, uh, co-founder with me of RPM and my partner and the person who actually takes the lead role on operations. Here is the ROV that is our key tool. It's here on board in the housing which is deployed into the sea and from it the ROV exits to uh, explore the site, photograph the site, and as you will see uh, recover artifacts when that's deemed appropriate. Any recovery of artifacts is of course done with the consultation with our uh, Sicilian uh, archaeological partners uh, and is placed immediately in their custody for conservation and study and uh, where appropriate museum display. Uh, for all of the importance of these ancient naval battles, no archaeological project had succeeded in locating the remains of any of these battles. So the source of this project began in 2003 when Dr. Tuza learned that a ram had been uh, taken from the sea in the vicinity of the Egede Islands uh, illegally and was in a dentist's office in Tropany. But when we learned, he learned that it had been taken near these islands, that provided enough uh, of a clue to inspire him and enlist us to make a determined effort to locate the remains of the battle. Uh, that involved defining a search area, which you see in color, which unfortunately, uh, because the uh, ancient peoples did not use GPS, was began at 24 square miles. To put that in perspective, that's equivalent to the island of Manhattan, uh, a very big area to search underwater but uh, here we defined the topography of the site. As we later learned, this, cap this next slide captures our current knowledge or belief about the, how the battle occurred. The Carthaginian fleet went from Carthage to Maretimo, the most offshore of the Egede Islands, and remained there overnight, stayed overnight, presumably to take on more water, rest the crew, then sailed east, intending to make uh, a dash to Drepanum Tropany and unload the supplies for the fleet. Therefore, and this was critical, the Carthaginian ships were loaded with supplies. Even though many or most of them had to have been warships, they would also have been encumbered by uh, the cargo they were carrying. The Roman fleet went to Levanzo, the southernmost island, where they could anchor out of sight of the Carthaginians. At some point er early in the morning of March 10, 241 BC, Romans learned that the Carthaginians were setting out from Maretimo. Now we know that the Roman fleet sailed northeast around Levanzo, which would have kept them out of sight of the Carthaginians, then turned west once they passed the northernmost point of Levanzo to directly confront and get in the way of the Carthaginian fleet, which must have been a, a, a terrible surprise and source of panic for the Carthaginians, given that they were loaded with supplies and not in uh, optimal uh, condition for battle. Here you see the battle zone as we now know it as viewed from Mount Eriche, where if a, a Carthaginian or Roman uh, soldier had a telescope, they might have seen the battle occur that morning. And when the ships collided, here is a reconstruction of what it must have been like by the National Geographic's TV. that was then, this is now, this is what happens when we find one of the warships. Uh, it come, the ram comes into sight on the, uh, con in the control room from the ROV cameras, and the rams at this site typically are visible sitting on the seabed. The wood is, of course, uh, 
gone, long since consumed by marine organisms uh, and currents, but it's a very exciting moment when these come into view. And please bear in mind that before this project, no ancient naval battle site had been located, and only, I believe it is, two rams had been found at all, both by happenstance. One, an Israeli snorkeler, one, a, uh, an, a Sicilian fisherman in the Straits of Messina, none of which had archaeological context. But here's a bit of a flavor of what it's like in the control room. Uh, that's Peter Campbell in the foreground, Matt Polskowski to his uh, right. Uh, the rams are, are such important objects, even though they are up to 200 kilograms, uh, that we uh, recover all of them for the uh, Superintendenza del Mare. It is an incredibly nerve-wracking process. Here's a condensed version. What we have to do is get a lifting strap tunneled underneath the ram. Then it can be cinched and tightened using the ROV, then connected to the, a lifting crane we have on board and pulled up Every one of these is nerve-wracking and can be a days-long process. That's one on the boat. Um, now we are partnered with Global Underwater Explorers, a network of highly trained, unbelievably skilled technical divers, and particularly led by Francesco Arena and uh, Chico Spaggiare, no, Mario Reno and Chico Spaggiari uh, and their team, and they have uh, participated since 2017 and play a critical role in doing what things that the ROV is much less efficient at. Here they are tunneling under a ram to cinch it up, something that a diver typically can do in one 20 minute dive whereas using the ROV, it can sometimes take uh, a full day or even two days. So it's critical to acknowledge what a great contribution they've made since joining the project. Here is the great moment when a ram sees the sunlight for the first time in more than 2,000 years. Everyone rushes to them. Here I am in the green shirt, I always like to look in the teeth of the ram because very often we find wooden remains of the other guy, the uh, enemy ship that the ram had punctured. Peter Campbell on your, the left looks inside the ram because there is a large cavity once the wood disintegrates and that is a perfect home for octopus who are uh, inveterate collectors of objects. These, these are all things that have come from within uh, the uh, ram cavity. You see nails, worship attachments, and ballast stones. Ballast stones are of great interest because they can be sourced and provide uh, strong proof wh whether a ship is Carthaginian or not based on where the stones came from. Here is the most aesthetically attractive of the rams, at least in my subjective judgment. Uh, it is also from the 249 BC Roman fleet that was captured, we believe, uh, because of the names on the ram that are connected with uh, re Republican Roman uh, inscriptions dating to about 250 BC. The ram also proves that the concept of a naming opportunity goes back to at least Roman civilizations. The, these are the names of two gentlemen who were key stores, which were, I think of them as equivalent to Chancellor of the Exchequer, who either administered the funds to pay for the ram or perhaps uh, paid for it from their own funds. Then above their names you see Nike, goddess of victory, who uh, in this case was not particularly successful because there's every reason to believe that this ram was first captured in 249 BC and then 
put in service by the Carthaginians and then uh, defeated and sunk in 241 BC. Here is Nike. Uh, here is that ram uh, as it on tour in an exhibition at the British Museum in London. I happened to be uh, working in London at the time, and so I particularly enjoyed on Sundays having uh, the ability to come visit it. Uh, you can also see that it, like almost all of the rams, had battle damage. Here is a side view of the ram. This is actually a British Museum postcard, and you can see both the battle damage, but also the uh, precision with which the, uh, these rams were designed, the ratio of thickness to thinness, uh, pu maximizing puncture area while reinforcing the uh, fins uh, behind that. Uh, a critical consideration was not only to be able to puncture the other enemy ship, but also to be able to get back out. And evidently, it's clear a lot of learning went into the design of these rams. Uh, not all of them were uh, worked well at all. Here is a ram that was clearly uh, steamrollered by presumably a larger ship that sliced right through it and reached uh, the hull behind the ram with probably un virtually undiminished force. No surprise, therefore, that this ram is on the seabed when we found it. Uh, Carthaginian inscriptions are on the Carthaginian rams, but they are much less uh, elaborate, uh, but also, no doubt, sincere, as you see here. Um, here is a painting showing the uh, uh, aftermath of the battle. I show it in particular because you can see the helmets which are very evocative when they turn up on the seabed because they remind you uh, of what was involved in this. Here are several of the helmets on the boat. All of them so far are of this similar type, which we believe was used not only by the Romans, but by, by the Carthaginians. Here is the most distinctive so far. We recovered this in August of 2018. It is extraordinarily high, almost comically high. Looks a bit like the, if any of you remember the Coneheads on Saturday Night Live, one guess is that it was uh, so that the commander of the uh, Marines on board could uh, recognize and keep track of where he was. That's just speculation, though. Uh, ceramics, of course. Amphora were what were used to carry the supplies. Here is the recovery of one of the most uh, predominant types by far. It is a Greco-Italic amphora, a type that was used both by the Carthaginians and by the Romans. There are, I think we have seen something like 800 of them so far. Uh, common, but also at the site, are rams of, uh, or, or amphora of a distinctively Punic shape. This is one, they tend to be smaller than the others. Uh, we always wonder whether this might be a, 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 an amphora carrying the payroll. Alas, it did not. Um, to sort of sum up what we've found so far, first here you see the search area with the dots showing air artifacts we have mapped. Here's a better view of that. The yellow triangles are rams identified thus far. All but a couple we have raised. We will raise others uh, this coming season, as I will explain. But what you can see here is the landscape of the battle as it is beginning to emerge, um, moving from the top down a south-southeast line that is the uh, uh, at least a portion of the fleet. We now believe that this was the northern or left uh, area of the battle line and that the remainder or the bulk of what we have yet to dis discover moves toward the southeast. If you see E15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, those are all rams we located 
uh, last summer, that is in August of 2018. Uh, so it appears this is a separate sort of formation within the battle. Uh, looking at this uh, image, you can also see reds. Those are those gre gre Greco-Italic amphora. Notice how spread out they are. They are never all, or virtually never, in touch with each other, usually spread at least 10 meters apart. We are now investigating how far they disperse when they fall into the sea. Perhaps they were jettisoned by the Carthaginians either when the Romans came into sight or after the battle began to go against Carthage and they knew they had to lighten ship and get uh, try to escape to the west. Uh, there are also blues, which if I recall correctly, mark helmets, and whites that may be the Carthaginian uh, type, distinctive type ceramics. You can also see lighter colored gray shading. That represents, depicts, it's mapped, areas where the ROV has been and its sonar mounted on the ROV, a forward-looking sonar, has uh, tells us what we see. What this implies is that in between these areas, these are large areas where we have not yet uh, examined and mapped what's there. This is a close-up showing the activity we did, area we covered, and what we found last summer, that is 2018, during uh, second half of July 2018 through second half of August. A very productive year. You can see that within this area at about K15, it was another area where same sort of thing happened. This is a particularly exciting image. Uh, this is a ram which uh, we began to expose for lifting and then saw that there is an extensive deposit of ballast stones and the ram is much more deeply buried than the others in this sediment which uh, suggests poten greater potential for more preservation perhaps even of some of the hull remains but also in any event in all likelihood of the nails and other accoutrements of the ship that will might enable us to plot the full uh, dimensions of one of these ships because there's still a great deal of mystery about even a, as fundamental a question as that. Um, here it is in 3D view. It's also particularly exciting that this coming season uh, we uh, have been told we will be joined by the Italian Navy vessel Anteo, which is equipped for and specially uh, designed and crewed for underwater uh, operations, including rescue of submarine crews, uh, other deep water operations, and includes the... Uh, uh, crew and equipment for what is called saturation diving, in which a team of divers can be uh, pressurized in a chamber to equalize the bottom depth here at the site, which is approximately 85 meters. Then they remain in the chamber and swim out to work, then return to the chamber, and that enables them to work up to six hours a day. Uh, after they've been equalized, of course, then it's a long process uh, for them to re readjust to be brought back up to surface pressure, ambient pressure. Uh, but it's an important skill for them, and they need to maintain uh, their uh, certifications. And we're thrilled that the Italian Navy has told us that they expect to come in July and uh, we can put divers to use on sites such as that uh, Ram 16 I just showed you. Here's another view of the Anteo. So that's the end of the presentation for now. Uh, no doubt we will supplement it uh, later uh, this year. I'm speaking now as of 
uh, June 7, 2019. Uh, we returned to the site on uh, July 1, 2019, and we'll continue on into August, including with the GUE team and the Italian Navy team. Thank you very much.